This episode is brought to you by Meow Wolf. Come creative, leave creative. October is the Cosmic Howl at Meow Wolf Denver. Take our immersive experience and add a splash of strange enchantment with events, workshops, and other special surprises. Get your ghoul on with events like Adultiverse, where the wild things roam, only for the Gronly on October 16th. Costumes are encouraged. Must be 21 or older. Learn more at meowwolf.com slash cosmic dash howl. That's meowwolf.com slash cosmic dash howl. Do you love public transportation? Sure you do. But do you love RTD? That's a very different question. And we're asking all the hard questions to the candidates running to represent Central Denver on the RTD board this November. This is the urban core of our city, where many of us take buses, ride bikes, walk, and try to park our cars. So come on out tonight to the Buell Center downtown for a candidate forum, 7 p.m. All the details to RSVP are in the show notes. Today on CityCast Denver. Denver's newly empowered auditor's office is going after wage theft in this city because it's a big and growing problem. We spoke last week to the head of Denver Labor about his recently announced investigation into the allegations of wage theft inside three local strip clubs. Since that interview, the strip clubs have responded with a lawsuit to protect their internal company documents. But we already know a lot about what goes on inside these clubs, thanks to our regular guest, Megan Ululani Boyanton of the Denver Post. She joined me and producer Paul Caroli on the show last year to share what she's learned about labor issues inside these unique legacy businesses, PT Show Club, the Diamond Cabaret, and Shotgun Willies. Oh, and stick around to the end of the episode for a sponsored interview from our friends at B Civic about an upcoming conference here in Denver on corporate social responsibility. Today is Monday, October 7th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Megan Ululani Boyanton, welcome back to CityCast Denver. Hey, thanks so much for having me. And my producer, Paul, is here as well. Hi, Paul. Hey, Megan. Hey, Bree. So, Megan, are strip clubs a dying business? I wouldn't say dying, but definitely changing. I've learned a lot about the strip club industry and writing this story more than I thought that I would ever know. Yeah. Where are we at? Where are we at with these things? Yeah. So uh, the market size of the industry nationwide is actually shrinking. And so what I learned is that this is not um, recession proof industry. For Hmm. instance, back in 2008, like it got hit hard, just like every other industry, it had to change during COVID. And now that we're kind of in like a shaky economic forecast, it's still kind of, it looks like uh, dancers never really know, you know like what kind of money they're going to make when they uh, go on stage. So it's more about economics than maybe it seems at, at first. Cause like, I have to say that, I, I've, COVID, okay, COVID for sure, mm-hmm. right? Things that were in person. Right. A, a strip club is absolutely, <laughs> that's what you go there for, yeah. to be in an experience with another person. Um, so I could understand where that could be a downturn. But like, I guess when you say economics, it's like the the business itself is shrinking. Is it because people aren't spending as much money? Definitely. Like customers aren't? Yeah. Uh, hmm. In times of like economic uncertainty, I mean, visiting a strip club is one of the first things to go. Uh, so people aren't spending the cash that they used to. And then also there's the fact that like we're in a time where you can be in bed and watch OnlyFans or, you know, porn. And mm-hmm. so people uh, feel like it's less convenient to go for that in-person experience unless they're part of like a bachelor or bachelorette party or are just extroverts like that. And like the bachelor bachelorette party, I would assume is not as big of a money maker for a dancer because it's like a stop that someone's making with their friends on the way right. to go do other things. You right. know, it's, it's not like they're coming in. I mean, maybe you're coming in with a lot of money, but my experience yeah. with bachelor <laughs> or bachelorette parties is is we're it's the entertainment value. It's the it's it's the last hurrah aspect of right. it versus let's go spend a lot of money at this. And they're club. usually younger, so a lot of dancers too kind of rely on regulars, and these regular customers will follow them to different clubs. Um, and the, that's kind of how they know that they're going to make money that night. Um, one dancer that I talked to said that she actually won't go into work unless she has like some regulars lined up who are going to be coming by because then she knows it'll be worth it. Because ultimately, um, strippers have to pay to be at the clubs. They have house fees. They have to tip out the staff. And so there are times when yes, girls. Will 
will bring home thousands of dollars. But then there are other times when they'll owe the house hundreds. And so they actually, you know, went in, worked, and then leave like with $300 less. Well, we're, we're talking about the dancers a little bit and like where their, what their choices are, are mm-hmm. you know, and OnlyFans you mentioned. What, what allegiance or what purpose does the club serve for the dancers? Why do they need it? Yeah, especially if they have to pay into it. Yeah. And it's not like they get benefits or time off or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. It's, it's just like paying to work. Yeah. Ultimately, it does come down to the money because, I mean, one of the dancers I talked to said she can make anywhere between 200 to $2,000. I think, too, like with social media and OnlyFans, you really have to like cultivate a following. And so that takes a lot of time. And sometimes, you know, when you're strapped for cash, uh, it makes more sense to go in and, you know, you can leave with thousands of dollars. The OnlyFans part I'm so curious about because I would assume if I was someone in in the sex work world, I would mm-hmm. way rather prefer that mm-hmm. to the in, especially because you're not paying out the house when you are running your OnlyFans. Is that like cutting into the strip clubs revenues in general? Like are more oh, and more people turning to OnlyFans? Yeah, exactly. And that's what they're competing with. And I talked to a professor who specializes in covering um, the world of sex work uh, over in Kentucky at Morehouse. She told me that, you know, there's just people, like you said, go to strip clubs for the in-person experience. So it's like they can't really compete with the OnlyFans or, you know, um, social media because uh, like that's their business model. They can't change that business model. You know, if they start to try and do something online, then that's that's camming. So it's like they've just kind of different. Exactly. Um, Yeah. Hmm. So it's interesting. We'll see kind of, you know, I think her uh, conclusion was that she thinks strip clubs are always going to be around. But are we going to have as many as we do now? Probably not. I mean, we don't have as many as we did in the 90s. And that was, you know, considered the golden age because it had gone through like this kind of resurgence where strip clubs are glamorized, where like a lot of businessmen were going. It was kind of looked at as, uh, I don't know, uh, a more glamorous activity than Hmm. it was in the 70s. Definitely. They said it was a little bit seedier back then. Well, that kind of brings us back to um, the current moment where Mm -hmm. we're going through this new change of the post pandemic period. And maybe we could talk about Denver, how it's impacting our the market here. How, Mm -hmm. How big is it? How many clubs, how many people do you think are actually involved in this? So that's a good question. Um, From my own research, I was able to see that we have like more than a dozen clubs, but it was hard to pin down a number because I reached out to the Colorado Secretary of State to try and see how many strip clubs we have across the state. And uh, they actually don't track the industry that a business operates yeah, in. The, that was so interesting. I know, the, the number or, you know, how many employees they have. And I was like, huh. Or even just like assumptions you make from maybe a business name because i know the i think it's the llc of shotguns is the bavarian inn shows up on your oh, credit really? card Interesting. yeah i think that's what shows up on your <laughs> no credit <way>. card <laughs> yeah I, because i think that's like a protection for their customers yeah, definitely. but i would also mm-hmm. assume how would you track that from an official state if it wasn't just like oh yeah. shotgun willies players club huh. pts scarlets bavarian inn <laughs> is that a restaurant? Okay. Uh, exactly. But I but I feel like it like you you pointed out this detail that they don't track it. I feel like that's kind of important. Like how do you regulate it? Doesn't it require special policies or like mm. do do lawmakers talk about this ever this industry? I mean, not that I've you know, been able to find in my own research, but it does seem that there's some interest in. Um, so, what I had talked with uh, the professor about is that a lot of times um, dancers can get screwed, you know, when it comes to their jobs, because they're actually like not considered full-time employees. They're considered like contract workers or gig workers. And so it's like, and then they have to pay out the house. And so it's like, there are a lot of questions being raised in the Denver area about, you know, like, are they getting paid minimum wage? Are they being treated, you Mm -hmm. know, like, like, you know, full-time employees? It's like tipping culture to the max of like all that uncertainty. It's any other labor force issue, I think. That's what I really loved about your story, Megan, was you sort of demystified some of that, like you're saying, is like the misconception that sex work is... Uh, you're rolling in money. Like, right. Uh, th- where and in reality, it's more like a gig. It can be more like a gig worker experience where you have ups and downs, but you mm-hmm. have zero security. You don't get a salary. You don't have health care. You don't get a t- tax refund at the end of the year. If, I know as a freelance person. Yeah. So I think it was helpful to understand the precarious nature of this industry for um, the workers that do it. It's like any other labor industry. Yeah. There's maybe an exploitative angle to it. Mm-hmm. 
This episode is brought to you by the Denver Film Festival. The Denver Film Festival is back from November 1st through the 10th, and it's your chance to experience some of the biggest films premiering in Denver before anywhere else. There, I mean, obviously, a giant fountain Coca-Cola. Can't not do that. Popcorn. What am I talking about? Junior Mints. Hi. The best. It's the only place I eat. The only time I ever eat Junior Mints is at the movies. It's like that's where they're where they belong. You know what I mean? But here's the best part. It's not just about the blockbusters. The Denver Film Festival is your opportunity to discover hidden gems you might never get to see anywhere else. We're talking indie films, groundbreaking documentaries, and emerging directors. This festival is packed with unique stories that will stay with you long after the credits roll. So don't miss out. Head to denverfilm.org to grab your tickets and get ready to immerse yourself in 10 days of incredible cinema. That's denverfilm.org. We'll see you there. Hi, this is David Plotz of CityCast. Have you thought about a gift for yourself this year? One that has the power to help you grow and learn and become a better version of yourself? Give yourself the gift of language by getting Babbel. With quick 10-minute lessons handcrafted by language experts, Babbel gets you talking a new language in three weeks because talking is the key to really knowing a language. And that's how Babbel approaches it. It's designed for real conversation. So I have a trip to France planned with my girlfriend. Was it inspired by the Olympics? Yes, it was. And it's given me the chance to revive my old high school French. And it's so fun to catch back up with the vocabulary I'd forgotten, to remember all the food, for example. I'm in a lesson on ingredients, so I'm going to make crepes with butter and sugar. Avec sucre et de beurre salé, on va se régaler. We're going to have a feast. They learned this great new French expression, too. J'en ai l'eau à la bouche. That means I have water in the mouth. That means it's mouth-watering. Love it. Love French. Anyway, Babbel gets you talking, and studies from Yale and Michigan State University and other leading universities prove that it works. So here is a special holiday deal for CityCast listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for CityCast listeners at babbel.com slash citycast. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash citycast, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash citycast. Rules and restrictions may apply. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. October is the season for wearing masks and costumes, but some of us feel like we wear a mask and hide more often than we want to at work, in social settings, and around our family. Therapy can help you learn to accept all parts of yourself so you can take the mask off because Halloween masks should be part of a fun costume, not your daily life. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash citycast to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash citycast. So we're back, and... We wanted to talk to you because you wrote this story about strip clubs and and the economics part of it was really interesting to us because there's also this business or this This big player, (laughs) big big fish in a little pond coming in sort of Hooters style restaurant, which again is not a strip club. You wrote about the company, RCI RCI Hospitality Holdings. Holdings. Yeah. Another one of these mysterious names (laughs) with a lot of. So I think it's for RCI is for Rick's Cabaret. Right. Yeah. That's the biggest brand that they yep. own of yeah, the so national. Yeah, they own Ricks, chains. Scarlets, and yeah, and I did read when I was like looking through their um their investor reports uh, that they own Bombshells, right? Yes. Which is yeah, I, I think apparently that, that, huge in the south. Yeah, that, I, I saw that it was pretty big in Texas. It's... But it's this World War II themed Hooters style <laughs> restaurant <laughs> and bar. And Sounds I... like boomers would go crazy for that. <laughs> that's what we were saying. <laughs> that's what we thought. Like, I know exactly who the target clientele is. But like, is that a growing clientele? Because to me, that feels like a shrinking clientele. I think that I would agree with that. It's just a bizarre. And I do well, want to make sure we're not equating Hooters style, that 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 kind of a restaurant to a strip club. They're different. But I think that they 
probably cater in some sense to very similar crowds. Well, it's owned by the same guy and he yeah, has true, his own theory true. about this, which okay. is the thing that captured my imagination about this company was he said he is making this big buy in Denver by opening the bombshells across from the DCPA from buying up that giant food hall that Troy Guard was doing down in Greenwood Village. That's He's spending right. like tens of millions of dollars because he says that the Denver market is flush with young single men who work in the tech industry. Hmm. Huh. I know. That's what my response what was. What do you think about that? Hmm. I think that's interesting. <laughs> I think I think those are OnlyFans people. I don't yeah, think that, they're going to bombshells. Well, that would be my assumption yeah. too, is it's like any other trend for younger folks is if you can get it on an app or it's accessible in an easier way, you're probably going to do that. Definitely, because we're less... more online. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I mean, this sounds more like a place that like somebody like my dad's age would go to. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. That's what I thought was weird. And but also, I mean, we have to I don't I don't know how this plays into the experiential ex, the, right. like this idea about experiences mm -hmm. like millennials love experiences. Me, <laughs> Meow Wolf is an immersive experience. Right. Like is a strip club the immersive version of OnlyFans? <laughs> like maybe I don't know. Could probably argue that. Um yeah, I just also, I mean, for him to say that this is like a market that's flush with people in the tech industry. I mean, look at all the cuts that the tech industry is making mm -hmm. right now, too. So it's like, I don't know. I guess we'll see how this business decision plays out. I'll it's, definitely keep an eye on it at the post. It's kind of fun to see the the way the web of the economy, the local economy works like that together mm -hmm. with tech and this and strip clubs like coming together. But it's all over about people and their values and what they want to spend their money on. It's so interesting. But also we've talked about with the how the internet works is every hyper niche thing you want to access is there. So, yeah. and I would say strip clubs are on, on the whole, especially here in Colorado, mm -hmm. very heteronormative. Definitely. And I wonder how much that is intersecting with young people's tastes and desires. Yeah. However, I was able to, so mm. it was very difficult for me to get a hold of the managers of the clubs. Of course. Yeah, I can only imagine why they wouldn't want to talk to the press. <laughs> um, but I live uh, near um, Boys Town, which is a, right. uh, a, gay, a gay strip club totally uh, on South Broadway. And uh, their owner was more than happy to kind of chat with me. And um, even he said that uh, ever since the pandemic it's been it's been really tough Has to it? to recover as a business and they've been open for i think it was i think they're close to two decades now and yeah and they cater to the lgbt community so and is it's there tough anything, for everybody is there anything different about the business the way they operate other than the transparency you know being open to talking to you i think uh what i noticed is i i don't think their dancers make as much as like hmm. um i think be in part because it's like a more of a regular bar ex yeah. not, but like i've been there and i know a lot of friends that go there and we're not like going for a, yeah we're not going right. for a bachelorette party we're going to hang out with other queer people yeah <laughs> so it's like but also i think what's interesting is i'm not surprised that he talked to you because i think the lgbtq community is way more embracing definitely of sex work and the understanding of its intricacies within mm -hmm. our communities versus the sort of high uh, up in the castle owner mm -hmm. of shotguns versus where the dancers are as sort of the gig workers so yeah. I don't know. I never I didn't even when we we this whole time we've been talking about strip clubs, <laughs> Boys Town did not once cross my mind because it's like a more regular hangout place to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, there's one other local story that we were hoping to talk about that's kind of oh, uh, the <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Do you know the Ja Morant shotgun oh, Willie's story? Of course. Megan, can, <laughs> does anyone want to summarize it? Maybe you could summarize well, he it. Was, he, he plays for the Memphis Grizzlies. He's a young star. NBA. NBA. High flying superstar. Uh, very fast player, fun guy to watch, but he's had some really off the problematic off the court situations. And one of them involved him being in a strip club here in Denver and uh, showing a gun, I believe on Instagram live. Like, and it, it was annoying to me because it got wrapped up in the fact that he was in a strip club, which is like sort of not important to the story. But as a result of that, he, I mean, this was, there were multiple incidents with him. I think two different ones with a situation with a gun, but Shockman Millie's had a, a little bit of a moment on the national stage. Yeah, that's what I'm interested in. Is, this didn't happen in just any strip club. This is the iconic and not Denver, Glendale, and did, specifically Glendale <laughs> strip they, club. Didn't they turn, did they turn over surveillance tape or something? 
I don't know. I, I have to look I back saw, at the details. I thought I saw a screenshot of the surveillance tape I in th- one of the stories, I and there's just cash everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> but like, but that was also. I think that was one of the issues with this. Beyond that, was betraying your customers experience oh because shotguns sold out job kind of, when like you Damn. don't have to you don't do sell that your high roller i mean he's bringing money into the well, club also that just night. like why are you selling anyone out this is your business these yeah. are your customers also like privacy for your dancers i don't know it was a whole they've been in hot water legally for a while yeah they have and There's i think they're probably wanting to maintain and... relationships yeah, I don't know. But it was it was interesting that because be my for, guess. for a moment people were like, oh, Denver has a crazy strip club. And it's like, well, you, uh, yes. But anyway, but anyway, Megan, the question <laughs> the question I have about this crazy situation is Ja, he's a high roller. Mm-hmm. Who how do the the dancers see him? What is his role in the in the economy of strip clubs? Like, mm-hmm. is he a regular type of like, customer they get? The high oh, definitely roller. not. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think figured. that when they encounter a high roller, at least from the stories that I was told, it's usually maybe once, twice, three times in their, like, you know, career so far. And granted, two of the women that I talked to are, like, 24, 26. So, like, they're still pretty early on. Um, one of them's 35, and I think she's probably seen more. Um, but, yeah, it's... High rollers are kind of are pretty rare. Um, usually, it's a lot of people get their money from regulars, um, the regular customers that are loyal to them, and w- they know they're going to get you know. So uh, that like movie picture that we have of the high roller is really a, ra- a rarity. Definitely, mm. definitely at Shotguns mm. or the Bavarian Inn. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking more so than like somewhere that's famous has a you know like right. Atlanta's. Mm-hmm. Uh, Right. Maybe somewhere in Miami. Or, like, yeah, Las Vegas, like the well, the places that are known. That says something about Denver that our iconic club doesn't doesn't have a lot of high rollers. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man, that's kind of a bummer. Actually, I want to live in a city where there are anyway. Um, <laughs> well, we might get there one day, Paul. We might, we but might. I also With think all that these young tech. I, uh, <laughs> if only we could that get feels to be so elusive to me. I'll be honest <laughs> with you, Megan Ululani Boynton. Thanks Thank for joining so us. Much. This yeah. was fun. In. Thanks, guys, so much. And now, a sponsored interview from our friends at Be Civic about an upcoming conference right here in Denver that you're invited to join. Hey, I'm Paul Caroli, producer on the show. I'm here with Jess Welser, the director of Be Civic. Jess Welser, welcome to CityCast Denver. Thanks for having me, Paul. I'm excited to be here. So, you work for an organization called Be Civic which I had not heard of before we started working together on this. And I'm so curious what it is. So Be Civic is an affiliate of the Denver Metro Chamber Leadership Foundation, and we help organizations with their corporate social responsibility and environmental social governance strategies. We help convene amazing organizations from across the Denver Metro area together to talk about best practices, elevate their work, find collaborative partners, and just uplift the great work being done in our state here. Jess, you mentioned a couple of phrases there, uh, big buzzwords right now and kind of controversial in the business world from what I understand. Corporate social responsibility and environmental social governance or ESG, uh, those mean different things to different people. What do they mean to you? Corporate social responsibility or CSR is how a company chooses to make an impact in our communities, whether that is socially or environmentally, It can be internally with employee engagement strategies or externally, like partnering with a nonprofit. Well, on the other hand, environmental social governance or ESG has more of a framework to it. Some criteria that companies need to hit as they align their environmental, social and corporate governance structures around managing risks and opportunities. So preparing for the future, essentially. Like what? What do you mean? What kind of framework are we talking about? That is going to look more specific to every industry and company size, but there's more regulations typically from the United States SEC, from the EU as well, and just requirements that a company must meet related to its supply chain, how it works internally, if it has a public board of directors. Um, I know I'm making it sound a little bit scary, especially for smaller organizations, but it's really not. 
I'd love to hear an example about how you might work with a small organization that wants to have more of an impact, but doesn't have like a big board of directors or like a big quarterly shareholders call or something like that. We work with a lot of small organizations. In fact, about 45% of the people that I work with represent companies with less than 100 employees. So this is an everyday topic for me. One way that we've really helped an organization is they started out with their own employee volunteer day. They looked at it, they had some great engagement from employees, but they wanted to make a larger impact, more than their 30-person team really could. So they started to invite clients one year, the next year they added on suppliers, and the next year after that they looked at other folks that were just partners in the community. This day has now grown to be close to 100 folks gathering, volunteering with an organization that's meaningful to the company, and then they end with a great barbecue. So it's really about making a larger impact and building deep relationships while supporting the great organizations in our community. So Be Civic itself is interesting because you all have been around for like 10 years now. The 10-year anniversary is coming up this November. You all must be doing something right. What's something that stands out to you from the first 10 years? We've done a lot of things right and have a lot of moments that we're really proud of over these last 10 years. But it's truly the Be Civic Summit, which is also coming up this November 13th and 14th that we are most proud of. It started out with 100 business leaders almost 10 years ago. And this year, we're expecting to have 450 community and business leaders coming together to figure out how we can make more of an impact in our community and beyond. What can listeners expect from this summit that Be Civic has coming up? Well, what you can expect is definitely high excitement from these folks. The energy is through the roof every year, and it's a day that I look forward to as well. You can pick your set of sessions, so whatever is meaningful to you. If you want to talk about your carbon footprint and how you can manage ESG regulations, we've got conversations and sessions targeted to that. If you're looking to make more of an impact with your marketing and communications, not only with the media, but internally, we've got sessions and people for you as well. We also have two national keynotes and a CEO panel because this goes beyond just our people inside the companies doing the work. We have great leaders who believe in this work and we want to showcase just how folks have built a business case over the last 10 years. So I'm betting some listeners out there are thinking, I want to attend this thing. Um, What do they need to know? It's open to anyone. It is the perfect professional development opportunity for engaged employees, whether they have a full role in this work or they're just curious about it as well. Or if you want to champion it and build your own program internally, it's open to anyone and folks can find more and how to register on our website, bcivic.org. But it's not how you probably expect it to be spelled. That's just a regular B and then the word civic, C-I-V-I-C dot O-R-G. B-C-I-V-I-C dot org. You've got it. Well, Jess Welser, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Paul. Again, you can check out bcivic.org to learn more. We'll have that link in our show notes as well, so you're just a click away. Thanks for listening. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed this show, why not take a minute to tell RCI Holdings CEO Eric S. Langan about us. Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you later. The 90s were not great for women, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>